All right, hello everyone. Before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome everyone to our virtual event space. My name is Ali. You might recognize me from our Lake Forest Park location, and I am your host for this evening. I am so excited to be introducing poet Sherry Rind here to discuss her collection, The Storehouse of Wonder and Astonishment. But before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. And as much as we miss having these events in our bookstores, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and of course for buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. If you haven't gotten your hands on a copy of any of the books that come up this evening and you would like to, I will be linking books in chat. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in and grab a copy off the shelf. Um, if not, or, or you can also um, put in an order and just come pick up in store. Or if you're not local or not leaving the house, we of course ship. So go ahead and follow those links in chat to our website. Uh, while over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the new year, including an event or two in person, which is very exciting. If you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and excited releases, our online book clubs, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So tonight we are here for about an hour and towards the end we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, we always love to hear your questions, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from in chat. And oh, um, oh, Joy, I hope that you can see me now. I, um, from what I understand, occasionally it takes a second for, for the video to show up, but hopefully that will resolve here in any second and let me know if it doesn't, okay? Um, so... Let's see, go ahead and share where you are from in chat. We love to hear from you. Let us know what you're thinking about. Um, and when it comes time for questions, do make sure that those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. While you're in our chat and question spaces, I wanna remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Uh, for anyone interested, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. My goodness, hello from Bardstown. Um, should any technical issues arise, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them. And we appreciate your patience and understanding. Um, and I think that that is all of my housekeeping. So go ahead and settle in, get cozy, because without further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Sherry Rind, award-winning author of The Hawk in the Backyard, A Fall Out the Door, and Between States of Matter, as well as chapbooks, The Whooping Crane Bands, and A Natural History of Grief. She has received grants and awards from the Seattle and King County Arts Commissions, Pacific Northwest Writers, National Endowment for the Arts, and Artist Trust. The book tonight is The Storefront, uh, the Storehouse of Wonder and Astonishment, winner of the 2020 Islands International Book Award. It celebrates our study of natural history, the combination of discovery and error that has been passed along for nearly 2,000 years. All right, so thank you, Sherry, so much for being here. And with that, I'm gonna pass the stage to you. Okay. Thank you, Allie. And thanks for everybody who came. You know, I can't see names and faces, but I'm very grateful. Um, so for this reading, I didn't necessarily choose 
the poems that are my favorites. I chose ones that are sort of story-like and can be easily followed when you hear them. And all the poems in the book are based on natural histories. And all the writers are white European men, um, partly because those are the ones who wrote, those are the ones who've been translated. Uh, when I, there was a writer I wanted to find who was in the Middle East, he wasn't translated. Um, let's see, so basically I would say in my poems, I've appropriated their work, sometimes incorporating their words with mine. And every poem begins with an epigraph from the author on whom it's based. The title for the book doesn't describe my poems. It's, it comes from uh, Samuel Purchase, about 1625, who wrote, got to get this title, Purchase His Pilgrimage, or Relations of the World and Religions Observed in All Ages and Places Discovered from the creation to the present, pretty much everything. When he was writing about hummingbirds in South America, he wrote this, nature making this little shop her great storehouse of wonder and astonishment and showing her greatest greatness in the least instruments. So I'm going to start with this poem, something light. Uh, Jean de Lery was a French Protestant who went to Brazil in 1556 to establish the first Protestant mission. Before that, they were all Catholics. But when you consider that, you know, Columbus got there in 1492, and here we are, 1556, and there was so much happened, so many Europeans invaded in that time and it changed everything. The Ray wrote about the Tupinamba people with whom he spent a lot of his time. Now in his writings, he does call them savages and he honestly believes that they needed to convert in order to save their souls as they all did. But he writes more like an anthropologist with a sense of humor than a missionary. So this poem is based on an incident that he records in his book. Jean de Lery confronts a monster. And he writes, not only are the Tupinamba utterly ignorant of the soul and true God, what is more, they neither confess nor worship any gods, either of heaven or of earth. Rashly we set forth without a guide, and lost our way in a valley where the trees stood back and the underbrush whispered. When we heard a rustling on a rise, we hoped a savage out hunting would reveal himself and guide us back to the village. Instead, 30 feet away, a fearsome lizard, bigger than a man, with scales as sharp as oyster shells and burning eyes, rose from the greenery. Days before, when thunder set the savages trembling, we declared it a sign of the true God whose grandeur shook heaven and earth. They said, a God who frightens is good for nothing. We have work ahead to bring them to truth, but may make inroads through their belief in souls. The virtuous who avenge themselves and eat their enemies retire to an Elysian field behind the high mountains, while the worthless ones who turn the other cheek are trapped by the devil in eternal agony. Now we three had not, on, not even a pistol, only swords, puny against the furious and well-armed animal. It opened its maw to pant like a dragon. We froze, lest a twitch arouse it to run us down and devour us. A full quarter hour it stared until turning, immense tail crashing through leaves and branches, it swarmed uphill while we slumped to our knees with thanks for deliverance. Later, I recalled that lizards delight in looking at a human face. If so, 
this one took its fill of pleasure in gazing at us, while we nearly emptied our bowels before this prospect of hell. Now, I don't know if you can guess what animal, but it's thought it's, it's got to be an iguana. Now, they could grow the, to about five feet long. Of course, a lot of it was tail, but then they only weighed 17 pounds. So you could tell that he exaggerated a bit. This poem I'm going to read now is the one that set off the whole collection. Other than that, I can't explain why this happened. Um, Charles Morton was a nonconformist minister and astronomer. He was about to be arrested for sedition in England for promoting progressive education. So he left for America in 1686 and he taught at Harvard. He wrote a textbook on astronomy and physics. So you can see, I mean, this guy was not a nutcase. While still in England, he wrote a treatise on bird migration, a topic that would still be a puzzle for another 200 years. In fact, I was just reading in Smithsonian Magazine about the was it Hudsonian Godwit in Alaska, and there's how much is still not known about the migration. But here's this guy's theory, birds in the moon. Their cheerfulness seems to intimate that they have some noble design in hand, namely to get above the atmosphere, high and fly away to the other world. During a full moon in autumn, I watched geese in their V formation flying upwards into the pale light, their leisurely wing beats disguising great speed. We have traced the life histories of beasts, insects, and fish. We discovered industrious cities in a drop of water and mapped the circulation of blood in our bodies but the destination of birds in winter eluded us. Now we turn our eyes to the heavens and see the moon is to earth as earth is to the moon in the planet's sojourn through the heavens. For the creator would not fashion a world without someone to live on it. Where else should birds upward flight take them but to the moon? They swing on fast asleep, living off their own fat for the two-month journey without gravity to slow them. Through the telescope, we see dark patterns of water and lighter shapes of hills, all pale and silvery, the water somber gray and the trees shifting from gilt to slate. Here, migrating birds acquire new feathers and blend with the trees drowsily eating fruits and insects before the long flight back to earth and all the work of begetting and raising young. I seek funds to train 25 cranes to carry me to the moon in a basket, to fashion wings from swan's feathers to speed me past earth's gravity, to explore the moon's terrain and search out its inhabitants Gifts of beads which have proved useful to earthly travelers should suffice. To chart the course so that others may come after me and enrich our country through trade. When the cranes notice a change in air and abatement of food, they will carry me home where I will write a full account for the Royal Society and the edification of the public. I remind you that the age of exploration is in its infancy, and we may solve one of creation's great mysteries, as did Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo, if we discard our insular belief in Earth's supremacy and follow the natural inclination of birds into the moon's embrace. Okay, from the 17th century, I am moving, I should say jumping, far back in time to Aristotle. 
whom I thought of him as a philosopher and Alexander the Great's teacher. And I, I didn't even know until a few years ago that he wrote the first biology textbook based on observation, mostly on observation. Um, and that was what it was in use for about the next thousand years because nobody else bothered to go outside and look around. So, and the incident I'm writing about actually happened. It was in Idaho a few years ago. Dumbfounded goats. If you catch hold of a goat's beard at the extremity, all the companion goats will stand stock still, staring at this particular goat in a kind of dumbfounderment. Aristotle's History of Animals. The field not to our taste. We followed the ram around broken fence boards and down a strait where wild rose and nasturtium tasted of perfume and peppery marigolds seasoned the short but tender grass. We spread out, nobody running, among the people and dogs, we touched noses. One person flapped us away, others laughed and scratched our backs, but we could not stop roaming, searching for another fence to show us where to be. We circled and bunched, wandered up and down the hard road between green lawns and tasted more bushes and plants, many new to us. We floated out of our ordinary days until the truck came with the chute to guide us. And the man seized the ram by his beard and all of us stilled, wondering at where we were and how we'd been led to confusion. A lot of these poems I wrote during the pandemic. And while I don't, I don't mention it in anything, but it was, it was there in my head. Um, kind of in that poem and in some others where cr I mentioned crowd behavior and it's not crowd commentary that I made up. It comes directly from the sources. So this next one is a total change of mood from the previous. I'm sure, you know, you've heard of the Roman games and first the conquering general would have a parade, you know, through the streets of Rome followed by hugely cruel fights involving animals, gladiators, hunters. And this is one that Cicero commented on. Pompey takes elephants to Rome for his triumph ceremony. Nay, there was even a certain feeling of compassion aroused by it and a kind of belief created that the animal has something in common with mankind. That was 55 BCE. In Rome, we pleased them with games, our trunks stronger than bows, hurling arrows straight and true against the wind. We walked a tightrope to show how they misjudged our grace and stepped neatly among them when they toppled in their wine like fruit rotting in the dirt. Until they rose, to their malevolence. Walls of men surrounded us in the arena. Their thousand, thousand shouts crazed us against the men throwing rocks and spears. We had no choice but to stomp them back into earth, painting ourselves with their blood. Then came hunters, whose acid smell we knew from home. One speared our leader's eye. We had no time to see the life go out of him. They pinned our feet, hacked our trunks and throats, cut the tendons on our legs. Our tears and blood ran ditches in the ground. We rammed the walls which shook but did not fall. The last of us raised our heads and reached our trunks to the gods. We sang out lamentations until the people sang with us and the spears stopped. We touched our kin goodbye. 
their bones scattered across a continent not ours, and the shame breathed through us until we died. This one comes from a book by Gerald of Wales, who was a clergyman who went to Ireland twice in the 12th century, the second time in the company of English King Henry II, who I think he was the first Norman, he led the first Norman invasion of Ireland, and of course they kept invading ever since. So Gerald of Wales wrote both facts and the fantastic in the history and topography of Ireland. And of course, they all thought Ireland a very primitive sort of place. I'm only gonna read just one section of this poem because it's a long one. And this, this section was partly to illustrate the anti-Semitic assumptions that were part of their daily lives and their weird beliefs. Archdeacon Cambrenesis lessons from the birds of Ireland. First he wrote, can any good come of Ireland? Part one of barnacles which grow from fir timber. There are likewise here many birds called barnacles which nature produces in a wonderful manner. Of the myriad forms of propagation, that of the barnacle goose is most remarkable. They lay no eggs, nor raise goslings, but generate like fruit on a tree. At first they appear as lumps of pine pitch before enlarging their white shells striated with black, suggestive in color, size, and shape of the geese's heads and the stripings on their backs and wings. Clinging with the long stalk of beak and neck, and floating with a current tossed log like seaweed, the fetal birds and tiny feathers grow safely, nourished most miraculously by the wood's juices, until large enough to free themselves and swim on the waters or launch into the air for the journey to landfall. As the shell represents the form and makings of the goose, so nature demonstrates symmetry in creation, wherein the maker repeats patterns like an artist for our appreciation and humble edification. With the barnacle goose engendered of wood and the bee bred from the honeycomb, nature affirms, like the pastor in his sermon, the original power of the Holy Spirit. But the Jew, whose arrogance is as constant as the sun, who dares not deny the first man begotten from clay and the woman from man alone, as written in his Old Testament, with obstinate malice denies his holy procreation from female without male, and sows the seeds of his own destruction. In the face of nature's irrefutable argument for our faith. That was a pretty common way of preaching, you know, using examples from nature to support their beliefs, to moralize. Um, and there's some other poems here sort of referring to the same kinds of things. Okay, so we had geese growing from trees. And a while later, there was this debate going on between the Reverend Alexander Ross and Sir Thomas Brown, who was a scientist and logical thinker. Um, people still read Brown, but not Ross very much. But I find Ross was a lot more fun. The Reverend Alexander Ross explains Griffins. He writes, besides, though some fabulous narrations may be added to the story of the Griffins, as of the one-eyed Aramaspi with whom they fight, yet it follows not that therefore there are no Griffins. Note that in Arcana Microcosmi 1652. 
at the edge of the inhabited world, where all things most rare and beautiful are found, near the cave of the north wind Boreas, that violent old man of wings and ice-spiked hair, whose sighs hurl men off mountains, where griffins build their lairs high in his cave, the Eremaspi men, whose desire has no end, crawl up in search of gold. A thousand men wait for a moonless night to invade with spades and sacks. But if one should ring the silence with iron on stone, the sharp-eared griffins rise on thundering wings. Plucked up like mice, men break with cries that rumble down the mountainsides. Made wealthier by danger, those who escape with gold say the griffin is lion-bodied with an eagle's head, claws the size of drinking cups, black feathers along its back, white wings, and eyes like fire. Do they fly or leap with claws outstretched so far that those who fall in terror believe them airborne? Do their eyes burn red? or reflect mere firelight. Though fearsome beasts grow larger in the mind, it does not follow that they cannot be. If any say such animals as griffins are not found in our civilized world, I say that may be true, for they live in places so remote, and many there still are, that Europeans dare not pursue and only stolen gold descends into our hands. I had this all organized, oops. I don't know why I did that. Um, I've got sticky notes and other notes and all kinds of things all over the place. Okay. And we go from Griffins to the Phoenix. I read a lot of Pliny the Elder uh, for this book. And he wrote pretty much, you know, the encyclopedia of everything. And he, um, if you, you probably heard the name, he was the one who died when Mount Ves Vesuvius erupted and it was thought to be around 79. CE. He was skeptical about a lot of the things he reported, but he kept an open mind. Pliny ponders news of the phoenix. The birds of Ethiopia and India are for the most part of diverse colors, and such as a man is hardly able to decipher and describe, but the phoenix of Arabia passes all others. I do not say that this is true, only what I have heard. There is never but one in the world, and no one reports seeing him. The phoenix may number like other rarely seen birds around whom tales grow like gossip. Such may be the phoenix, whose story has traveled to Rome from Egypt and Arabia. No one has reported seeing the young of the sea eagle in Rome in 500 years. Amid the general heedlessness to all knowledge which has of late prevailed, it is more likely that no one has noticed them or the phoenix, if it exists. Manilius, famed for his immense learning, gives the most detailed account of this bird. The size of an eagle with gold crest like a polished helmet, he raises into a plume. Below is a neck plate of black striped gold feathers. The rest of the body, a deep red mixed with purple, ends in an azure tail, all glowing when touched by the sun. Sacred to the sun god in Arabia, his lifespan is 540 years coinciding with the revolution of our great year when stars and planets return from the positions whence they began. When death comes, 
He builds a nest with cinnamon and frankincense and yields up his life. From his decay climbs the tiniest worm, which grows into a bird, Persephus, whose first duty is to his father's rights, as it should be. He takes up the whole nest and carries it to the Temple of the Sun in Egypt, placing it reverently upon the altar. Cornelius Valerianus writes that in the time of Claudius Caesar, a phoenix was carried to Rome to be shown to the public assembly. Today, nobody doubts this was a counterfeit phoenix, though all the crowd believed the spectacle, as crowds do. What then is true? Only that there is no end to the colors found in birds, more various than in an imperial garden, their luster like polished metal changes with degree and angle of light as if a creature transforms itself before our disbelieving eyes. I looked at lots of bestiaries. They were um, mostly because I love the pictures. The writing was for the clergy who would use it to preach to their congregation. The pictures were for the general public because they couldn't read. So they got the, the good part of it. And I think the most famous is the Aberdeen bestiary from 1200 CE. In this short poem, the snake that I mentioned was a fanciful creature said to be so marvelously colored that it stupefied people who saw it. Cetalis. The snake called Cetalis gets its name because it glitters with such a variety of colors. Aber Aberdeen Bestiary, 1200 CE. She cannot join your drinking parties, your warm rooms lit by fire. Beneath notice, she puts all effort into her dress, gold and diamonds, a glimpse of peacock blue leaving you hunting for the rest of the bird, or maybe a butterfly, you think. Blinded by sunset pink and copper, you slow. She's just here, down here, among the multitudes, the mud and moss where desire starts. It tricks you awake holds you mesmerized, and then she has you. Oh, this one is fun to write. Um, Edward Topsell was, what century was he? He wrote the history of four-footed beasts in 1607. And like Pliny, he gathered existing knowledge and so combined reality and myth. He considered that beasts and the knowledge of them are divine. And here's everything you need to know about toads. The physic of toads. Toad, the most noble kind of frog most venomous and remarkable for courage and strength, Edward Topsell. To ward off contagion, carry a dried toad. A dried toad spe steeped in vinegar and laid on the, to the forehead stops bleeding at the nose. Fear of a beast so contrary to human nature constrains the blood to run in its proper place. In the presence of poison at your table, a toad will change color. If someone offend a toad, she gathers air into her body and sighs out that poisoned breath as near the offending person as she can get, and thus has her revenge. If air causes blindness or dizziness, seek the toad. A toad rubbed against a sprain will relieve the swelling. 
How is it that in men's stomachs are found frogs and toads? The evil happens to men who drink water, for from the water, toad eggs slip into the stomach where they cleave fast and grow without air, as do all the evils of the psyche. To cast out the toad, disembowel a servant, serpent, cut off the head and tail, cut the body into small pieces, and soak in water until the fat rises to the surface. By drinking this and vomiting, the man will void all the toads before they release their venom and kill him. Toads dried and beaten to powder make strong poison of wine. After eating toads, the bears of Pamphylia being killed by men do poison their eaters. If an asp eat a toad, its bite is incurable. The stork will not eat a toad except in famine at which it becomes as poisonous as the toad. Any animal may harbor the toad's venom. There is no ward against toads. I think I will bring you to the last one, which is the, the only poem in the book that um, uses a recognized form. And this one is a Sistina. And for those who are, <laughs> who are not poets, the, a Sistina is, um, has stanzas of six lines with six end words that repeat in each stanza, but the order of the end of words changes in a particular way. And then in the final stanza of three lines, the six words can be used in, in any order. So the person I'm writing to here is uh, Jean-Baptiste Van Helmont, who was a Belgian scientist in the 17th century. I mean, he was the man who identified carbon dioxide. He, he worked with numbers of gases. Here, however, he decided he has proved there is spontaneous generation using gases and other things based on this experiment that he did. Jean-Baptiste Van Helmont explains a biogenesis. And in this one, the epigraph comes from Aristotle. Animals and plants come into being in earth and in liquid because there is water in earth and air in water and in all air is vital heat, so that in a sense, all things are full of soul. In Egypt, after Nile floods, the people thought mice grew from silt, nose first toward air, where they dried and breathed in life before fattening themselves in the fields of corn and wheat. We may have doubted, but I have succeeded in their generation, not with Nile silt, but this clay pot. My previous experiment growing and measuring a tree in a large pot for five years showed plants feed on water and light, unlike mice and other animals, surely reproduce or generate spontaneously from what only appears to be empty air. Now I have shown how a sweaty shirt, open pot, and wheat combined their forces to activate life. It is well known that worms hatch from mud and fireflies gain life in morning dew. Consider then how this clay pot acts as the enclosure for the fumes from wheat, grains, and a worn shir shirt to become the leavening force producing mice. With the help of whatever found is found in my shed's air, the pressure of one animating force against another generates the creature that may afterwards reproduce for generations in the usual ways. Such is the versatility of life and the mystery 
of all we cannot see in air and earth as represented by this humble pot from which emerged in 21 days, three mice, suggesting, as you may surmise, the shape and color of wheat. Truly, we may say that wheat sustains all. Unknown still our degree and moisture needed to generate such lower forms of mammals as mice, and what might be the chemicals in human sweat that kindle life in the warming stillness of the open pot. We must ask, what other properties or molecules does air conduct? Perhaps molecules from everything on earth drift in air and gather to their desired form. Wheat and cotton grow with sun and water. We forge our pots from earth and fire. The four elements provide the spark to generate the process of combustion that builds to life, perpetual in seeds, eggs, parents, and autogenesis, as with our mice. Nothing then is lost. The vital heat survives in air, wheat, cloth, mice, the very clay on which we stand or dig for pots. Beings generate in every combination, and everything on earth is life. That concludes storytelling time. Thank you. And I think Allie's going to come back on. Hello, I'm back. So we are going to switch over to some questions from our audience. Um, it looks like I have one here, but if anybody else has any questions, please do throw those in the Q&A. We love hearing from all of you. So let's start from this one. And if I mispronounce your names, I very much apologize, but I believe this is from Andrea. And it says, what was the inspiration for this poetry collection? Okay, well, as I said, you know, I started, I came across an essay by Charles Morton proposing, you know, how birds migrate. And, I don't, you know, I started researching him because I wanted to know precisely what he said, when he said it, circumstances, etc. And he just, that led to another, and I just kept going. And I think right after him, I encountered Aristotle's History of Animals which, I, you know, I hadn't heard of. And um, all these authors, I found them online. You know, I was writing a lot of this during the pandemic when I couldn't even get to into the UW library and places like that. Um, so, oh, also I listed at the back of the book the, the names of all the people. And I think I should I include the names of their books. So anyway, anybody can just Google some of these and find these guys, you know, Herodotus, Aristophanes, Aristotle, Cicero, Strabo. I mean, people I hadn't heard of until I, I just started reading around. Yeah, that, that, um, that research must have been fascinating for this book. Can you talk a little bit more about how you found some of these books? Well, you know, I hardly remember. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be reading one person and he would mention somebody else. So I would look up this other person. And for each writer, I compared as many translations as I could to be sure I was, I wanted to be absolutely accurate in, at least in their intentions. You know, when you're reading a translation, you always lose some things. Um, maybe wish I hadn't forgotten all my eighth grade Latin. Because <laughs> a lot of the writing was in Latin and there was Spanish and French. And so, yeah, it's not an exact process. You know, as I was reading around, I would choose the writers who interested me the most. Sort of smoke, spoke to me. I really wanted to write more about uh, the animals and bestiaries, but I, I don't know, I couldn't make a go of that, except for that <laughs> one. 
So I have a question here from Lauren, uh, which says, you are a wonderful reader and great at describing historical references. Were you ever a teacher? <laughs> I taught composition like so many poets with <laughs> master's degrees. You teach in New York colleges. <laughs> so I have a we have a comment from Gary here that says, um, great job, uh, but I'm going to have nightmares about toads. <laughs> I'm all thank you, Gary. I also am gonna have some nightmares about toads, I think. Um, so a question that I always love to to ask authors um is what was your best day working on this this collection and what was your hardest day? Oh. All the days have blurred together. Oh, I know. <laughs> you know, I think the best day was discovering Aristotle's history of animals. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, I, you know, I took beginner's philosophy in college. And of course, who hasn't heard of Aristotle and all the references to him in through drama um, his, as a teacher of Alexander the Great. And this was never mentioned. This mm -hmm. wonderful book that he wrote full of... and. It was a lot of it was accurate. I mean, he uh, dissected animals and wrote about that. But then he also believed in, you know, spontaneous generation, like um, flies. Uh, what is it? Maggots would just, you know, spontaneously be in in dead things. And he did an experiment to show that. Of course, he was wrong. But <laughs> um. yeah, amazing. Um, was there? Is there something that you will remember? specifically about your time working on this book? Something that sort of will remind you of, of the era of writing this? Um, I started it before the pandemic started, but, and, and even then was, was working very intently. I, um, every single day, I, yeah, I spent a lot of time on this, not just the writing, but uh, the research, because you read a lot of things that you just discard. And uh, a lot of it, you know, just goes in one eye and out the other, because uh, you forget. And I, I really did wish I had people who had read the same things that I could talk to about it, but I didn't even know anybody who had read Pliny in translation, so. Mm -hmm. So I have a question here from Margaret that says, how many different animals have you lived with? And can you <laughs> tell us of one who might have written a poem about you? Ah, that's a great question. Write a poem. Well, I suppose it depends what kind of poem, but I, you know, in the um, dedication, it's dedicated to, in memoriam, to my mother who let me keep a dozen guinea pigs and much more. <gasps> let me see now. So the, it started with a couple hamsters when I was nine years old, and my parents were kind of astonished that I took good care of them and never had to be reminded. So that was how I <laughs> got to the guinea pigs and a pony, and yeah. then, um, you know, didn't keep any animals doing college. But then after college, uh, my husband bought me my first uh, citizen bird, a budgie because I said I, you know, really liked them and parrots, and then he later bought me my first parrot. So, oh, and I had rabbits as a kid. Let's see now. And the budgies, pony, lots of parrots, and now, and then chickens, have a snake, which was my son's science project that I knew I would, you know. <laughs> and, Dogs, of course. Of I, course. Dogs are so much a part of it. I don't even think of them as having animals. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. <laughs> part of life. Airedales. Only one kind of dog. Ah, uh, a menagerie. Oh, I didn't answer. Who would write a poem? I suppose one of the Airedales would. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. They're very smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I hear. <laughs> Um, so we have, we have some time for more questions. So as they come to you, throw them in the Q&A, folks. Um, in the meantime, I always like to know what you think the most important part of your writing education has been. Hmm. 
it, it wasn't something so it's what you just taught in class it was just what that's something that I learned in that stage when I was in college and so on which was to, to try to be a little more bold in my writing because I I tend to I tend not to be and then I remind myself you know go ahead and write that down <laughs> And I think that, you know, applies to anybody. Just go ahead and write it and then worry later if it's any good. <laughs> so um, what was the editing process like for this, for this collection? Are there poems that didn't make it in or any that you miss? Um, yeah, there's several that I just didn't think were good enough or didn't fit um let's see I think I was starting off on a tangent what was the question again specifically was are there any darlings that you killed that you sort of miss <laughs> um no I'm, I'm glad I didn't include them because they were yeah as I said just didn't seem as good as the others I did wish I could have or would have kept on writing these poems. But, you know, the last one in the book is the last one that I wrote, uh, Jean-Baptiste Van Helmont. And I was, you know, coming into um, the end of the time when people believed these outlandish things. I mean, the Enlightenment was, I don't know specifically when it started, but it was right around the corner. And that's when, People were, got, got rational. <laughs> they did write more about um, observation and just were, were more realistic. And so didn't lend themselves to this kind of poetry. But what I found as I was writing was, you know, each one of these, there is a certain logic in each one. I mean, their conclusions might have been proved wrong. But a lot of times, if you track the way they came to those conclusions, it makes sense. So I think as I was writing and living in this world, it all made sense. Huh. Somehow seemed real, even though I knew it wasn't. It's uh -huh. a really wonderful feeling. Yeah, there's something kind of magic about that. So as we, as we come to the end of our night, a question I always love to ask is, what are you reading have you read anything that you really want to scream about lately um well one book i came across not long ago was uh by marianne baruch and i've got to get the title because it just came out from copper canyon press um oh there it is no nope, that's not it oh well, anyway i won't waste time searching but um she had a Fulbright scholarship to go to Australia and then came away. And then there were those horrible fires and she wrote about the fires, but she also addresses Pliny in her book. So I thought, oh boy, <laughs> found Pliny. <laughs> I'm just trying to find this book that you spoke um, of. Okay. R-O-U-D. Oh, oh, darn it. I Sorry, know. I didn't mean to send you on a wild goose yeah, chase. Yeah, I'll, I'll never find it while I'm looking for it. I'll find it. <laughs> of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> and then a, a last question that I always love to ask is what is, what are you working on next? What should we keep an eye on from you? Mm, I'm kind of floundering around looking mm -hmm. for my next subject because I, what I liked about this book was its unity. And so right mm -hmm. now I'm just trying out different things and see if something works. I'm really trying hard to write about fish right now. <laughs> ah, I love that. <laughs> Not getting very far though. It's fish are difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. There's something otherworldly about fish. So I think that we are about at the end of our time together. 
So I just want to say one more huge thank you, audience members, for joining us this evening. Um, if you would like to get hand, your hands on copies of the Storehouse of Wonder and Astonishment, go ahead and follow the link. You know what? I'm going to relink this in chat so they're easy to find. So go ahead and follow that over to the website. Um, let us know what you thought of this event in person or on social media. We love, love, love hearing from you. Sherry, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much for reading. Um, I love just listening to these poems in your voice. Um, do you have any last thoughts or words that you'd like to share with us before we say good night? Just a major thank you to everybody who came. You know, it's it is weird. It's not my first time reading on Zoom, but it's a weird experience. <laughs> but the advantage is that more people can come to the reading, and you're not just talking to two people in the audience. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, it's wonderful that f friends and acquaintances signed up to be here, and I'm very grateful. And to be able to give this with third place. <laughs> Me it has been our absolute pleasure. So yes, echoing her, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and I believe that this is where we say good night. So shall we do the awkward waving thing? <laughs> Stop video. Okay. <laughs> good night. Good night, everyone.